Good evening. Welcome to workshop number three in our series, Biblical Blueprints. The subtitle for our series is God's Plans and Purposes for the Church. So the goal of this series, as we've laid out, is to clearly define what the church is and how we, both individually and collectively, work and fit into God's plans and purposes. So, so far, I'll give a quick recap. We've offered five messages. During our morning services, Pastor Jesse has offered three of those. Two weeks ago, we began the series, and Pastor Jesse began with a series titled The Formation of the Church. We looked at Acts chapter two, and we discovered that the church had a birthday, and that birthday was Pentecost. Last week, he offered the second installation of the series, and we learned about the foundation of the church. And simply put, the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. And this morning, Pastor Jesse presented the third message, the function of the church, where we surveyed the pastoral epistles and came away with 14 functions of the church. Now, in the evening, what we're trying to do is offer more practical, and we call it workshop style, and our first workshop was on sewing. Pastor Mike provided that. We looked at Ephesians 4, and he laid out three points. The prerequisite to sewing is regeneration. You have to be born again. The proposition of sewing is commitment, and the product of sewing is unity. And then last week, Pastor Andrew gave our second workshop on studying. We looked at 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and his two points were, why is it important to study God's word? And then he gave us some practical tips on how to study God's word. That brings us to tonight. And tonight's topic is stewarding. The Greek word for stewardship is oikonomia, a combination of two words, oikos, meaning a house, and no, it's not to be confused with that delicious Greek yogurt, and Nemo, to manage. So literally it means to manage a household. More broadly, it means to oversee someone else's proper, property. Sometimes in your Bibles, it might be translated that Greek word as administration or even dispensation, meaning a mode of dealing with something. A steward, therefore, is an individual who's given responsibility over the affairs of another. An illustration of stewarding can be found in the Olivet Discourse. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Our baseline text for tonight's workshop, we're going to look at Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30, the passage known as the parable of the talents. But before we dig into that parable, I want to set the stage, beginning in Matthew 24. During last week's workshop, Pastor Andrew mentioned the importance of context, the necessity of context of, and when you understand a passage, and we're not exempt from doing so here. Matthew 24 and 25 are a unit, and this unit's known as the Olivet Discourse. And it's called this because our Lord Jesus Christ gave the discourse on the Mount of Olives. So if you're in Matthew 24, look at verse three. Now is he, Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, and then he carries on all the way through chapter 25. The late Dr. Larry Pettigrew provides this concise summary of the Olivet Discourse. He says, this discourse starts with the backdrop of a scathing rebuke. So I'll interrupt Dr. Pettigrew. So look at chapter 23 in Matthew, just look back. You see a lot of these paragraphs that begin with woe to you, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Jesus is rebuking the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. So the discourse starts with the backdrop of a scathing rebuke and proceeds to note that the stunned disciples, the doomed temple, it talks about the timing question, the unexpected delay, the great tribulation, the second coming, and the application. There's a lot in these two chapters. 
Now, Jesus relayed the words in the Olivet Discourse to his disciples. That's important to know. And that was to provide insight for the future of Israel. The church was not in view. The Olivet Discourse wasn't written about us. Keep that in mind. However, the principles established in the discourse are still relevant for us today. So now as we come into Matthew chapter 25, what we have in Matthew 25 is Jesus is now going to offer two parables. We have the parable of the ten virgins, and then we have the parable of the talents. The contrast in themes within these parables couldn't be more striking. The themes are judgment and rewards. In the parable of the ten virgins, we see five foolish virgins who were not prepared for the bridegroom, and they were shut out of the wedding feast. This pictures unfaithful Israel being shut out of Messiah's earthly kingdom. This showcases judgment. Now, there are five prudent virgins who were prepared for the bridegroom, and they were let into the wedding feast. This pictures the faithful in Israel who will be ushered into Messiah's earthly kingdom. This represents rewards. The determining factor between judgment and rewards is faithfulness. Faithfulness. So this then brings us to the parable of the talents. Now this parable also shows the contrast between judgment and rewards, and faithfulness is the determining factor between the two. So what I'm going to do is I'll just read the parable in its entirety, and then we'll circle back and pick it apart. So the parable of the talents, beginning in verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and handed over his possessions to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you handed five talents over to me. See, I've gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you handed two talents over to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Therefore, you ought to have put my money in the bank And on my arrival, I would would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does, even what he does have shall be taken away. And throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The cast in this parable has four characters. We have a master and his three slaves. So let's work through each of those characters. Let's begin with the master. The first thing we know about this master is he's wealthy. Look at verse 15. It says, And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. A talent isn't referring to someone's ability. A talent is actually a measure of weight. The weight of a talent in the New Testament was approximately 100 pounds. You might have that in your your topical index in your Bible. In this parable, a talent signifies a sum of money. So a key factor in knowing the worth of a talent would be to know what's being measured. 
So what's being measured here for these talents? Was it copper? Was it silver? Perhaps it was gold? We have no idea. Now there's various opinions, and there are lots of them from the commentaries, on the value of a talent. So one commentator notes that a talent is worth 60 denarii. A denarii is a day's wage, so a talent's worth 60 days wages, according to one. Another said a talent is worth 6,000 denarii, or 6,000 days wages. One more that I read mentioned that five talents are worth what a working man makes in 20 years. So we're kind of all over the board. Now, you'll have to indulge me for a moment. I want to take a stab at converting to our currency so we can get in our minds how much are we talking here, or potentially how much. Today, the Nebraska minimum wage is $12 an hour. A denarii is a day's wage, so if you work an eight-hour day and you get paid $12 an hour, that's $96 that you would earn in a day. So for the, just to make it easy math, let's say $100 a day. All right? So according to our first opinion, a talent is worth 60 days wages. So if you take 60 days times $100, you arrive at one talent being worth $6,000. Our second commentator referenced a talent being worth 6,000 days wages. So if you use the same math, we arrive at a talent being worth $600,000. And then our final opinion, five talents were worth 20 years of wages. This would mean one talent equals four years of wages. And by using Nebraska's minimum wage, calculating an annual salary, this would equate a talent being worth approximately $100,000. So however you want to calculate the value of a talent, and trust me, I spent a lot of time calculating it, we come to the realization that the master was rich. It's undeniable. And this man entrusted a lot to his slaves. Another characteristic we learn about this master is that he's accused of being a hard man. Look at verse 24, the middle of verse 24. The third slave says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Being hard means the master was accused of being harsh. Another way of thinking about this man is that he wouldn't budge, he was strict. This doesn't mean he was unfair or unjust. As we'll learn later, this master simply had high expectations. So that's the master. The second character in our cast is the first slave. If you look at verse 21, he's referred to by his master as being good and faithful. The third character in our cast is the second slave. If you go down to verse 23, the master says this slave is also good and faithful. And then we come to our final character, the third slave. This is our outcast. In verse 26, the master says this slave is wicked and lazy. So now that we have our cast, let's discuss the setting. This begins in verse 14 where it says that a man was about to go on a journey. Travel in those days was difficult. Oftentimes people would be gone for weeks or even months. This is because given the terrain, the weather, and other factors, it, it was difficult, nearly impossible to know how long a trip would take. And think about it today. We get frustrated if our flights delayed 30 minutes. In fact, we have apps on our phones where we can track the precise location of each other when they're en route. Suffice it to say, the characters in our parable didn't have that luxury. So this man was going to go on a journey. They didn't know how long, but it was going to be long. And what he did in verse 14, he goes on to say that the master then called his slaves and handed over his possessions to them. He wanted to make sure his stuff was attended to while he was gone. Things didn't stay stagnant. If your Bible translation is the NASB, it states that the master entrusted his possessions to them. The Greek word translated handed over in our LSB, Legacy Standard Bible, or entrusted, if you have the NASB, it means to give or to deliver. One Greek lexicon defines the word as 
to give into one's power or use. I think that definition fits, fits perfectly into the scenario. The master is giving his possessions into the power of his slaves. He's entrusting his possessions to them. So as this master hands over his possessions in the form of talents, it states that he does so according to the slave's ability. Look at verse 15. It says, each according to his own ability. The master knew the abilities of his slaves and he entrusted his possessions to them accordingly. There was an expectation that the slaves were to be faithful based on their potential. The first slave was given five talents. The second slave was given two talents and the third slave was given one talent. So what did the slaves do with their money? Look at verse 16. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. So in verse 16, we read that the first slave responded immediately. The slave didn't procrastinate by guessing the length of his master's trip and would get to it later. He didn't sweat bullets by fretting over how he will fulfill the will of his master. He didn't ask, what's in it for me? No, he immediately went and traded with him. The result, he gained five more talents, a 100% increase in what he was entrusted. In verse 17, it tells us what the second slave did with the talents. Look at verse 17. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. The second slave in the same manner gained two more. So like the first slave, he went immediately and traded with him. The result, he gained two more talents, a 100% increase in what he was entrusted. Now we get to slave number three, verse 18. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now let's pause here. If you're like me, and I've read this parable many times, if I'm being honest, I read that and think, what's the big deal? It's not like the slave went and squandered the talents on living recklessly like the prodigal son. In fact, it could be considered admirable that this man protected the money by burying it. What did he do so wrong? Well, let's consider some possible motives for burying the money. First motive, as stated, perhaps he was just seeking to protect it, protect it by burying it. That's a possibility. Another motive is, motive is that he coveted the money. Rather than trading it or putting it in the bank, he didn't want a paper trail. So in the case that his master doesn't return from his journey, he can just grab the shovel, dig it up, and then he's a rich man. Or the third motive is he panicked. Under the pressure of responsibility, he didn't know what to do, so he just went and hit it. Now what we do know, if you look at verse 25, look down at verse 25, he says that he was afraid. Ultimately, it's hard to know what his underlying motive was. But we, what we do know is this, his actions did not please his master. So this brings us to how the master responded to each of his slaves. Verse 19 says, now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Time's up, a reckoning is about to occur. Are the slaves ready? So slave one comes up in verse 20. It says, the one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents saying, master, you handed five talents over to me. See, I've gained five more talents. And then the next verse, we see the response of the master. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The master describes this slave as good and faithful. His actions pleased his master. The result, he'll be put in charge of many things. A relationship ensues that's characterized by joy enter into the joy of your master. In fact, we learn later that this slave actually earns an additional talent, down in verse 28. This is a desirable outcome. Now we come to slave number two, verse 22. 
The one who received the two talents came up and said, Master, you handed two talents over to me. See, I've gained two more talents. We get the master's response in the next verse. His master said, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Like the first slave, he will be put in charge of many things. A relationship ensues that's characterized by joy, a desirable outcome. Now we come to the third slave, verse 24. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. This man accuses his master of being a hard man. He makes an excuse for not managing faithfully what was entrusted to him. The accusation was, the, was that the master was unfair. His expectations were too high. And this man, all he wanted was others to do his work for him. He resented his master, and he demonstrated that through his unfaithfulness. And then we get the master's response, verses 26 to 30. The master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Therefore, you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away, and throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now you'll note, the master here actually didn't refute that he was a hard man. In verse 27, he says, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. In fact, he seems to affirm his hardness. He makes the point that his hardness should have been all the more motivation for this slave to have acted faithfully. At a minimum, you could have just put it in the bank. How hard is that? The master expected more from this slave. Burying the money was inexcusable, and the slave manifested his laziness and wickedness by not being faithful. The result? The talent was taken away and given to the first slave. The slave is to be thrown into outer darkness, a place characterized by weeping and gnashing of teeth, an undesirable outcome, to say the least. Verse 29 summarizes the parable. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. In the context of the Olivet Discourse, this parable teaches that at the second coming of Christ to earth, Israel will be reckoned with. Faithful Jews will be invited to enter into Christ's earthly kingdom. Unfaithful Jews will be judged and cast out. Now, the principles established in this parable still apply to us, and that's why I've taken us here tonight. And here are those principles. The one who faithfully manages what God has entrusted pleases God and will be handsomely rewarded. I'll say that again. The one who faithfully manages what God has entrusted pleases God and will be handsomely rewarded. The one who poorly manages what God has entrusted provokes God and will be scornfully rejected. The one who poorly manages what God has entrusted provokes God and will be scornfully rejected. Faithfulness is the determining factor. The parable of the talents helps flush out a working definition of stewarding, the topic of tonight's workshop. And actually, by me reading through this parable, this is where I came up with my own definition, and here it is. Stewarding is the faithful management of what God has entrusted. We have it up on the slide for you. Stewarding is the faithful management of what God has entrusted. And we're going to use this definition, and it will guide us as we consider our own stewarding tonight. We'll first look at some things that God has entrusted to us, and then we'll consider how to faithfully manage those things. 
Now, I could have went a million different directions with this, and I've condensed a myriad of options down to five so-called talents. That's what I'm gonna refer to them as tonight. So five so-called talents God has entrusted to us. Those talents are these. His image, the gospel, spiritual gifts, money, and the truth. Those talents are his image, the gospel, spiritual gifts, money, and the truth. So let's begin in the beginning. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, and we'll consider the implications of being created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1. The first chapters of Genesis provide insight into the creation of the world and all within it. We learn that creation occurred over a period of six literal 24-hour days. And Genesis 1 showcases the days of creation. So day one, verses three to five, God created light. Day two, verses six to eight, God created an expanse in the midst of the waters. Genesis 1, on day 3, verses 9 to 13, he created land and vegetation. On day number 4, verses 14 to 19, God created lights in the expanse of the heavens. Day number 5, verses 20 to 23, God created birds and sea creatures. And then we come to the final day of creation, day 6, verses 24 to 31, God created land animals, verses 24 and 25, and then we have the capstone of his creation, man, verses 26 to 31. So if you're in Genesis 1, look at verse 26. God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. People are created in the image of God, meaning we share his image. We are a reflection of God. It's clear here that man's set apart from animals. We're moral beings and we are designed to have a relationship with God, the creator. Man has a unique purpose and that purpose begins with being made in God's image that is unique to us. In fact, chapter two goes on to further elaborate on the creation of man. In verse 18, go to chapter two, verse 18, we get further information on a special relationship given to man. So chapter 2, verse 18. Then Yahweh God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a, a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground Yahweh God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. And he brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper suitable for him. So Yahweh God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And Yahweh God fashioned the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this one finally is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, because this one was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The animals were not a suitable companion for Adam. So God created Eve from one of his ribs, out of his side, and she was called woman. The foundation of mankind was established in this relationship we call marriage. The husband-wife relationship supersedes all other relationships, and it's through this relationship that we're to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So actually come back to chapter one, Genesis one, and look at verse 28. God gives, it, gives his first commands to man. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that creeps on the earth. Then God said, behold, I've given to you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth 
and every tree which has the fruit of the tree yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that creeps on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God commands mankind to exercise dominion. We are to be good stewards of his creation. The faithful management of the creation is laid out for us. In verse 28, he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God's purpose for man is to have children and to reproduce. And that's done through a special relationship called marriage. And it's through that where we are to be fruitful and multiply. So in summary, the first talent God has entrusted to us is his image. We faithfully manage his image by acknowledging our uniqueness among creation, exercising dominion, and being fruitful. The second talent that we're gonna talk about tonight that God's entrusted to us is the gospel. John 3, 16, the most popular verse in all the Bible, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Both of these verses showcase two things. The first is love. Notice it says that God so loved the world. God demonstrates his own love toward us. Both verses reference that God's love for us was the motivation for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on our behalf. And the second similarity in these verses is the object of God's love, and that's us. For God so loved the world. God demonstrates his own love toward us. The gospel, the good news regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on our behalf is God's gift to us. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the question is, what are you doing with that gift? I'd like you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter two. 1 Thessalonians chapter two. And what we'll do is I'll go ahead and read the first eight verses. 1 Thessalonians two, verse one. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our entrance to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much struggle. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, who examines our hearts. For we never came with a flattering word, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor seeking glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. In this way, having fond affection for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives, because you had become beloved to us. In the middle of verse two, Paul says, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much struggle. And prior to that, we learn about Paul's beating and imprisonment in Philippi, and that didn't deter him from coming to Thessalonica and sharing the gospel with them. This wasn't natural courage. It was supernatural enablement. Paul says that that boldness was in our God. In verse four, Paul speaks about being entrusted with the gospel. Look at verse four. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. God entrusted Paul, Silas, and Timothy to present the gospel. As a result, they proclaimed the gospel not as pleasing men, but God who examines the hearts. 
They fear God more than man. Uh, Last Wednesday's Pastors on the Proverbs, Pastor Mike gave a quote regarding the fear of God, the fear of the Lord, and that quote comes from C.H. Spurgeon. Spurgeon said this, as for me, I have braved the sneer of men because I feared the frown of my Lord. So a good question for you to consider is what frightens you? We've been entrusted to proclaim a message, a message that brings life to those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. How dare we keep it to ourselves? Turn with me to Romans 10. Romans chapter 10. You probably know where I'm going with this. Romans 10. And then we'll pick it up in verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. Don't you love the simplicity of that message? Let's just back into Paul's logic. Person A must be sent, verse 15. Person A must then preach the gospel message. Person B must hear that message, believe that message, and be compelled to call upon the name of the Lord. And then God steps in. Verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a pretty straightforward game plan. Yet we have a way of complicating things, don't we? Aren't you thankful, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that someone feared God more than you? I'm thankful for that. If you've repented of your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ, you've been entrusted with the gospel. The second talent that God has entrusted to us is the gospel. We faithfully manage this talent by boldly sharing the gospel with others, knowing that our aim isn't to please men, but to please God the one who examines our hearts. The third talent God has entrusted to us is spiritual gifts. Turn with me to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And we'll pick it up in verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound thinking and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling as each one has received a gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks as one speaking the oracles of God, whoever serves as one serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and might forever and ever. Amen. In this passage, Peter informs us that the future should guide how we act today, something that Peter had a knack for doing. Verse 7 says, The end of all things is at hand. And the next word is, Therefore. There to do something with that. In light of what's going to happen, this is how you ought to act. He says that they are to pray, and their prayers are to be guided by sound thinking and a sober spirit. Verse 8, they are to love one another. Verse 9, they are to be hospitable to one another. And then he adds the phrase onto that, without grumbling. And they are to employ their gift in serving one another. Verse 10. So in verse 10, what Peter does is he connects stewardship 
by the use of a spiritual gift. So again, verse 10, as each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The use of your gift in serving others is your way of faithfully managing the multifaceted grace of God. That's an amazing responsibility. And it's one that we shouldn't take lightly. Now tonight, this is not gonna be an in-depth study on spiritual gifts, but I do wanna note that there are a couple things to highlight here. We have two broad areas of giftedness. The first in this passage is speaking. This is the ability to explain God's truth. God gifts some individuals with the ability to teach his word and to proclaim it. The second gift is serving. Unlike speaking, this involves the nonverbal activity within the church, if I can put it that way. It's the ability to help or serve. God gifts other individuals with this ability. So what I wanna do now is I'm gonna give you four quick facts on spiritual gifts. We have them up here as a slide for you. Fact number one, the source and power of spiritual gifts is from God. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses four to six, the Apostle Paul says this, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are a variety of ministries in the same Lord, and there are a variety of workings, but the same God who works everything and everyone. A gift is not something you conjure up. A gift is not something that you work at diligently and then you earn it on your own. No, your gift is given from God. The second fact about spiritual gifts is that they are given to all believers. So if you're in 1 Peter still, 1 Peter 4, look at verse 10. It says, each one has received a gift. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've received a gift from God. These gifts, fact number three, are freely and graciously given. The Greek word for spiritual gifts is charisma. It's related to the word grace and is due to the grace of God, or we might say due to the unmerited favor of God. It is freely and graciously given. It is not earned. There's no room for your ego. And then the final fact that I'll give you tonight regarding spiritual gifts is that gifts are used to serve the local church. Look at verse 10 again. Each, each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Gifts are not to exalt the person, gifts are to enable a person to serve others, and through that, God is glorified. So the third talent that God has entrusted to us is spiritual gifts. We faithfully manage this talent by acknowledging that your gift is given by God to be employed in serving one another. The fourth talent God has entrusted to us is money. Well, we're running kind of low on time, so I'll just skip over this one tonight. We'll go to the last one. God cares deeply about what we do with our money. He does, and it's important for us to consider what he has to say. First and foremost, as God's stewards, we need to acknowledge that all that we have ultimately belongs to God, everything. Psalm 24, verse one, it says, the earth is Yahweh's as well as its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Psalm 50, verse 10 and 11 says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. God owns everything. And all that we have has been entrusted to us because God has chosen to do that. Therefore, we shouldn't have a chokehold on those things God has bestowed upon us. We must hold everything loosely, as one pastor said. This includes your possessions, and yes, this includes your money. Again, the Bible has a lot to say about money, and we're not gonna exhaust the topic tonight. But before we get in and I talk about some principles about giving, I wanna give two words of warning about money. The first warning that I have is don't let money rival God. In Matthew 6, during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he speaks of the fleetingness of money. In Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus says, 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here Jesus is contrasting treasures in heaven versus treasures on earth. The point is we are to focus on spiritual matters, not material gain. In the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he continues in verse 24, and he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And listen to this. He says, you cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot serve God and wealth. So warning number one, don't let money rival God. The second warning is don't let money entrap you. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy, Paul, like Jesus, pits the pursuit of riches against the pursuit of godliness. So if you're in 1 Timothy 6, look at verse 9. Paul says, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by aspiring to have it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Pastor Jesse made this point this morning, and it's an important one. Paul's not condemning wealth. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but there is something wrong to desire to be wealthy. There's a major difference between the two. In verse 9, he says that the desire to be rich produces many foolish and harmful desires. Evil things come from the desire to be rich. He elaborates on this in verse 10. He says that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evils. Now notice that the love of money is a root. It's not the fruit. It's the source of evil. Evil desires stem from the desire to be rich. For example, dishonesty and theft, where does that come from? That comes from the love of money. It's a root. And the love of money leads people astray. So be warned. Don't let money entrap you. So now that we've been warned about money, let's discuss how it can be used for God's glory. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul abruptly changes the subject matter from 2 Corinthians 7 as he comes into chapter 8 and introduces a new topic. So chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now, brothers, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. And what Paul goes on to do is he's encouraging the Corinthians toward giving. Paul lays the groundwork for giving all throughout chapter 8. He showcases the generosity of the Macedonians, and he makes a plea for the Corinthians to be generous as well. Look down at verse 7. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and word and knowledge, and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. And specifically what the Macedonians did it dis- despite their poverty and all that they were going through, they collected a gift for the church at Jerusalem. And Paul's trying to encourage the Corinthians to do the same, to be generous in their giving. As we come into chapter 9, Paul provides some divine principles of given, giving. And what I want to do is if you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to camp out in verses 6 to 8. And here we'll pull out three principles of giving. So 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows with blessing will also reap with blessing. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace abound to you, so that in everything, at every time, having every sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good deed. 
So here are some principles related to giving. The first principle we see in verse six is you reap what you sow. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows with blessing will also reap with blessing. In other words, your generosity pays off. Paul's not giving some shrewd investment strategy, but what he's making the point is, is that what you give, it's not lost. And how often do we think that way? You write a check, you give the money, and you think, well, that's gone. I'm never getting that back. That's not the mindset we are to have. Like seed to a farmer, we need to give knowing that it's going to produce a harvest of blessing. Now, this isn't the promise that it's going to increase your wealth, but what it is is a promise that God will bless those who bless others through giving. So principle number one, you reap what you sow. Principle number two in verse seven is this, your attitude matters. In verse seven it says, each one must do just as he purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The measure of a gift isn't based on the amount you give. It's based on the state of your heart. And only God can take that measurement. There's no quota for giving. God's concerned about your attitude. Do you remember what Jesus says in Luke 21 with the widow's offering? In Luke 21, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two mites. And he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all put in their gifts out of their abundance, but she, out of what she lacked, put in all that she had for living. God isn't concerned about the amount you give. God's concerned about your heart. To give grudgingly or under compulsion manifests the wickedness of your heart. If you give grudgingly or if you give under compulsion, you might as well keep your money. After all, that was likely your desire in the first place. A cheerful giver, on the other hand, is the one God loves. When we give, we should do it with joy. And when we give, we should do it because we know it pleases God. Principle number two, your attitude matters. The third principle related to giving is that it ushers in God's grace. Look at verse eight. And God is able to make every grace abound to you so that in everything, at every time, having every sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good deed. One commentator says this about God's grace connected to giving. His grace is always abundant and enriching. It always leads to increase, not decrease. So much so indeed that the overwhelming consequences of God's making all grace abound to them is that they, in all things, at all times, having all sufficiency, may abound to all good work. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't bestow his grace grudgingly or under compulsion? I am. God, through the bestowment of his grace, provides for the cheerful, for the cheerful giver. So principle number three, your giving ushers in God's grace. So again, those principles, you can see it on the slide. Principle number one, you reap what you sow. Verse six. Principle number two, your attitude matters. And principle number three, your giving ushers in God's grace. This brings us to our fifth and final talent God has entrusted to us. It is the truth. God's revelation of himself through the Bible is the foundation for every point made tonight. We would know nothing about God's image, the gospel, spiritual gifts and money if it weren't for God giving us that information through his word. Without word, God's word tonight, this workshop would be nothing more than trite anecdotes and opinions from someone who doesn't know a whole lot. Without God's word, we would be hopeless. Instead, we have intel directly from God himself. Now in a bygone era, the Jews possessed the keys to truth. In Romans 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? He says, Great, in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. At one time, the Jews were entrusted 
with God's word. Once the church was established in Acts chapter two and the mystery of Christ was being revealed through the apostles and the prophets, the keys to truth were transferred. Now the truth is upheld by the church. This morning, Pastor Jesse took us to 1 Timothy 3.15, and there Paul tells his young protege, Timothy, that the church of the living God is the pillar and support of the truth. As a church, we've even been entrusted with God's truth. What a responsibility and what an honor. Our fifth and final talent God has entrusted to us is truth. We faithfully manage this talent by supporting truth at all costs through its defense and proclamation. Stewarding is the faithful management of what God has entrusted. That's the definition that has guided tonight's workshop. Stewarding is the faithful management of what God has entrusted. Jesus' Olivet Discourse, specifically the parables of, ta- of the talents, illustrates stewardship. It showcases the, theme, the themes of judgment and rewards And the determining factor between the two is faithfulness. The principles set forth from the the parable of the talents are that the one who faithfully manages what God has entrusted pleases God and will be handsomely rewarded. The one who poorly manages what God has entrusted provokes God and will be scornfully rejected. Tonight, we've considered what God has entrusted to us in the form of five so-called talents. This includes his image, the gospel, spiritual gifts, money, and the truth. Tonight's scripture reading was from 1 Corinthians 4. And in verse two, Paul admonishes the Corinthians by saying, it is required of stewards that one be found faithful. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are all stewards. The question is, are you faithfully managing what God has entrusted to you? Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to come together tonight and to consider just a few things that you have entrusted to us. Father, we wanna be good stewards. We wanna hear a good and faithful slave Father, you have given us so many things, and Father, help us to steward those things in a way that brings honor and glory to you. Lord, we're thankful for this church. Father, thank you for the series that we're going through as we consider your plans and purposes for the church, and help us to do that with joy in order to bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.